Next, we're going to look at the brainstem. The brainstem controls automatic behaviors necessary for survival. Make sure you remember there are three parts to the brainstem, the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. The midbrain contains structures such as the cerebral peduncles and the corpora quadrimina. The corpora quadrimina is made up of two superior colliculi and two inferior colliculi. The pons contains many conduction pathways or fibers that act as a bridge between the midbrain and the medulla oblongata. Whereas the medulla oblongata is the location of several visceral motor nuclei controlling vital functions such as cardiac and respiratory rate, as well as vomiting, hiccuping, swallowing, coughing, and sneezing. Another center in the medulla oblongata is the micturition center, which controls urination. Here we can see the diencephalon, and below the diencephalon is the first part of the brainstem, the midbrain. We can see all the conduction fibers of the pons and the medulla oblongata below that. The medulla oblongata is continuous with the spinal cord. Next, we're going to look at the cerebellum. Don't confuse cerebellum with cerebrum. The cerebellum is located dorsal to the pons medulla or behind the brainstem, and it's under the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. It protrudes under that occipital lobe near the cerebrum and makes up 11% of the brain's mass. It's able to produce precise timing and appropriate patterns of skeletal muscle contraction, and cerebellum activity occurs subconsciously. The cerebellum is able to receive information from the sensory systems, the spinal cord, and other parts of the brain, and then regulate motor movements. So the cerebellum is able to coordinate voluntary movements such as posture, balance, coordination, and speech, resulting in smooth and balanced muscular activity. Here we can see images of the cerebellum, also known as the little brain. It's very convoluted, just like the cerebrum, hence its name, little brain. It is also going to have deep or internal white matter surrounded by gray matter. The internal white matter of the cerebellum, what may be called cerebellar white matter, looks like a branching tree, and it's known as the arbor vitae. There are two lateral lobes to the cerebellum, and they're connected by transverse fibers called the vermis. Here we're just going to briefly talk about cerebellar processing. The cerebellum receives impulses that are of the intent to initiate voluntary muscle contraction. Voluntary muscle contraction must follow a blueprint of coordinated movement that is sent to the cerebral motor cortex from the premotor cortex or primary motor cortex. The cerebellar cortex is gray matter located on the outside or superficially to the deep cerebellar white matter. And this part of the cerebellum is going to really be able to calculate best the way to perform a movement. The cerebellar also is going to play a role in language and problem solving and is able to recognize and predict sequences of events as seen in its ability to create a blueprint for motor movement. Next, we're going to look at two functional brain systems, and these are networks of neurons, so they're not necessarily located in any one location, but there's networks that work together and they span wide areas of the brain. So really, it's a true neural network. These two systems are the limbic system, which you can know as your emotional brain, and the reticular formation, which you can think of as kind of an alert system for your brain. The limbic system consists of a couple of structures located in the medial aspects of the cerebral hemispheres and the diencephalon. Some you've seen before, such as the hypothalamus or the amygdala. The amygdala is also associated with the rhinencephalon, which we saw in part A of this chapter, known as your smell brain. It's much more involved in or evolved in the human brain than it is, say, in primates like monkeys. But it is the primitive smell brain with the original name of the rhinencephalon. And the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, also a part of the limbic system. Just make sure you're remembering the limbic system is your emotional brain. And we can see that in the function of structures like the amygdala, which deals with anger, danger, and fear responses, or the cingulate gyrus, which plays a role in expressing emotions via gestures and helps resolve mental conflict. The limbic system is able to communicate with both the prefrontal cortex, which is a multimodal association area, and use memory in order to have an emotional response that's appropriate for past experiences. The limbic system, again, is involved in emotion, probably one of the most important keywords to associate with it, but it's also extensively connected to other parts of the brain. We talked about the prefrontal cortex, but it's really able to integrate or respond to a wide variety of environmental stimuli, especially anything that's an anger or danger or fear response. So it works well with the sympathetic nervous system as well. It plays a role in expressing emotions via gestures. It resolves that mental conflict by working well with the motor and sensory areas of the brain, but you're also going to be able to link it, for example, to olfaction. It puts emotional responses to odors, 
odors, which, for example, would be if you think something smells bad or something smells good. The limbic system interacts with the frontal lobe, specifically the prefrontal cortices, known as the multimodal association area. And that's why we can put conscious understanding to emotion or respond with emotion to conscious understandings. So it's going to make sure that we're consciously aware of emotions in our life. It also makes it easy for take emotion and logical conscious thought and put them together and associate memories with how we felt at the time that they were formed. And it's the hippocampal structures that convert new information into long-term memories. The reticular formation keeps the cerebral cortex alert. So alert is what we want to, want to think when we think reticular formation or the reticular activating system. The RAS or reticular activating system is able to dampen familiar, repetitive, or weak sensory inputs over time so that we're not constantly kind of distracted by all the sensory inputs that our body is constantly being given. So if you walk into a room and someone's wearing too much perfume or cologne and at first you smell it and it's annoying or maybe it's just too strong, maybe it's even kind of bothering your nose and making you want to sneeze, if you stay in that room over a period of time, you won't smell the perfume or the cologne as much. That is because of the reticular activating system, which is dampening the sensory stimuli that are allowing you to smell or allowing the process of olfaction. So the reticular activating system is actually able to dampen about 99% of all sensory stimuli as unimportant. Now, you may be able to feel where your shirt is touching you now that I'm talking about it, but in general, after you get dressed for the day, you can't feel every point of contact from your shirt or your pants or other clothing on your body. That is because the reticular activating system is dampening those sensory stimuli. A homeostatic imbalance, which is interesting to talk about, is the use of the drug LSD. LSD actually interferes with the reticular activating system and prevents sensory dampening. So it actually promotes overwhelming sensory overload. And we find that the reticular activating system is inhibited by sleep. And it's going to be depressed by alcohol, sleep-inducing drugs, and tranquilizers. But we'll see that the alert system for the body, so the brain, the reticular activating system, is going to be inhibited by sleep. And that's why your brain is going to be kind of on a more subconscious level during the hours where you are sleeping. Next, we're going to look at an EEG, or an electroencephalogram, which can record some aspects of brain activity. Normal brain functions involve continuous electrical activity occurring at the synapses between neurons, and these patterns of neuronal activity at synapses can be recorded or called brain waves. Now, make sure that you know that an EEG is measuring gene or the generated synaptic potential, so that's occurring at the synapses. It is not measuring action potentials. So action potentials would be activity in white matter, not necessarily at the synapse. Each person's brain waves are unique, and we can group them into the four classes below, alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves. So alpha waves occur when someone is awake but relaxed. So it's a calm, relaxed state of wakefulness. Beta waves are produced when someone is awake but alert. So definitely using that reticular activating system in order to focus on a problem or visual stimulus. Theta waves are more common in children, very rarely seen in adults. You can see some in adults when they are concentrating. And then delta waves are going to be indicative of deep sleep. So this is also seen when the reticular activating system is dampened or inhibited. Or we can even see, them, even see them when an adult is awake, but unfortunately they're suffering from brain damage. So brain waves tell us a lot about the state of the brain. They tell us what's happening at the synapse, how presynaptic neurons are able to communicate with postsynaptic neurons, and how neurotransmitters are traveling across synaptic clefts. We'll see that brain waves change with age, sensory stimuli, brain disease, and even the chemical state of the body. Electroencephalograms, or EEGs, are used to diagnose and localize brain lesions, tumors, infarctions, infections, abscesses, and epileptic lesions. Make sure that you note that a flat EEG means there is no electroactivity occurring at the synapses in the brain and it's clinical evidence of brain death. One homeostatic imbalance we want to talk about in some depth is epilepsy. And epilepsy occurs when there is abnormal discharge of brain neurons, so that's abnormal discharge occurring at the synapse. A victim of epilepsy may lose consciousness, they can fall stiffly, they have uncontrollable jerking because of skeletal muscle contraction, and that's going to be very characteristic of an epileptic seizure. Epileptic seizures can be long or short, and epilepsy is not or ever is associated with intellectual impairments. And epilepsy actually only occurs in about 1% of the population. 
Epileptic seizures include obstinate seizures, formerly called petit mal, and grand mal seizures. Petit mal seizures are mild and may be very quick, only a couple of seconds. And we can see them in young children. If you're ever staring at a child and their expression goes blank for a while and it starts to happen kind of progressively, it's possible they are suffering from absence seizures. A grand mal seizure is going to be the ones that involve kind of uncontrollable convulsions, intense convulsions. A victim may lose consciousness. They can thrash and break bones. They may lose loss of control over their bowels or their bladder, and they can bite their tongue. Control of epilepsy is usually by anticonvulsive drugs or the use of a vagus nerve stimulator or a deep brain stimulator. A vagus nerve stimulator would have to be planted, usually kind of around the shoulder, and then electrodes connected to the vagus nerve. And when a, either a button is pressed or at regular intervals, pulses would be delivered to the vagus nerve that would go directly to the brain and stabilize or kind of reset brain activity. There is research into a brain electrode similar to a vagus nerve stimulator that can be put directly into the brain and be able to prevent oncoming, oncoming seizures, not just kind of shorten the time that a petite mal seizure occurs. We want to define consciousness. Consciousness encompasses the perception of a stimulus and its integration, and then also the voluntary initiation and control of movement as a response to the motor output created by the integration. So its capabilities are associated with higher mental processing. So memory, logic, judgment, perseverance, these are conscious thoughts that are created using a reflex arc that involves both sensory stimuli and an input going to the brain and then a motor output that causes an effect. The loss of consciousness signals that brain function is impaired. So examples, fainting, which is also known as syncope, is a brief loss of consciousness. A coma is an extended period of loss of consciousness. And these are periods of time during which someone could not be kind of alerted just by shaking them or trying to get them awake. So even though fainting or syncope is brief, during that period of time, the person is unconscious. Clinical consciousness will be defined or graded on a couple of levels. We'll see how alert someone is. Are they showing some symptoms of drowsiness? Are they paying attention or are they in some type of stupor? Or are they in a coma? Are they unconscious? Next, we're going to look at sleep, and sleep is a temporary period of partial unconsciousness. And this period of time is going to be usually at night, and a person can be stimulated or aroused by stimulation during sleep. There's two major types of sleep defined in terms of the EEG patterns or their brain waves. There's non-REM and REM sleep. So non-REM is non-rapid eye movement. REM is rapid eye movement, and one passes through four stages of non-REM during the first 30 to 45 minutes of sleep. So we'll see that stages 1, 2, 3, and 4 of non-REM occur before REM sleep, which occurs after the fourth non-REM stage. And that occurs after the fourth non-REM stage has been achieved. And during REM sleep, we see brain waves that are similar to alpha waves of the awake state. And that's why most dreaming occurs here. So most Dreaming occurs during REM sleep, but we don't act on those dreams because during REM sleep, skeletal muscles are inhibited. The only ones not inhibited are those that move the eyes, hence REM sleep actually being rapid eye movement. So we'll see, for example, the ocular muscles be able to contract and move the eye. The only other muscle not inhibited would be the diaphragm, which is going to allow for inspiration and expiration or breathing. And again, most dreaming occurs during REM sleep. Non-REM stage 1 through 4 are non-rapid eye movement, and we see differing heights to their brain waves. It's non-REM stage 4 during which things like night terrors, bedwetting, and sleepwalking may occur. This occurs right before REM sleep when skeletal muscles would be inhibited. Sleep is really important. It's important that stages 3 and 4 are met for non-REM because they're presumed to be restorative. Even though things like nightmares and night terrors occur during these stages. We think that REM sleep is a reverse learning process where extra information or information that was in your short-term memory is purged from the brain. We do know that people become pretty groggy or moody or even depressed if they're deprived of REM sleep repeatedly. So daily sleep requirements may decline with age, but it's important to try to get eight hours of sleep per night. There are different stages of memory, and you're probably familiar with them, short-term and long-term memory. And these two stages of 
memory have a couple of different characteristics. For example, your long-term memory is actually limitless. It has a limitless capacity even if it doesn't seem like it, whereas your short-term memory lasts only seconds to hours, and only about eight pieces of information can be held in your short-term memory. Next, we're going to look at the protection that the brain has. And it has bone, it has connective tissue layers called meninges, it has cerebrospinal fluid. All of these substances are protecting the brain. It's going to shield it from harmful substances and any substance and kind of disrupt the blood-brain barrier. So let's look first in more detail at that protection for the brain. So for bone, we're talking about the skull, we're talking about the frontal bone, the parietal bones, the occipital bones, the temporal bones. So we're talking about the bones that protect the skull. The meninges are the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. These are three connective tissue layers that cover and protect the skull. They do have cerebrospinal fluid in them. The cerebrospinal fluid itself is also found in ventricles. It cushions the brain, it delivers nutrients and other ions to the brain, so it's great for the delivery of not only nutrient but chemical signals to different parts of the brain. The blood-brain barrier is a barrier. It maintains a stable environment in the brain and separates it from other environments such as external to the cerebro spinal fluid areas, or external to the central nervous system. If we're looking closer at the meninges, we want to again establish that the meninges are three connective tissue membranes that lie external to the central nervous system, but around the brain and spinal cord. They are the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater, and that is a list of superficial to deep meningeal layers. All of the meninges cover and protect the central nervous system, and within the meninges you may find venous sinuses and other blood vessels. The meninges do contain cerebrospinal fluid. You also find cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles, and we find that the dural sinuses or parts of the dura mater are actually able to invade large fissures of the brain and form partitions within the skull. Here is an image that's showing you the meningeal layers. But we start first with the skin of the scalp, then there's the periosteum or covering for the bone or your skull. And right under the bone of the skull is the periosteal meningeal layer of the dura mater. The dura mater is the outermost meningeal layer. It contains a periosteal and meningeal layer. The periosteal layer is close to the bone. The meningeal layer is close to the other meninges. Next, we see the arachnoid mater here in purple. The arachnoid mater also has arachnoid villi that proceed up into dural sinuses and are able to take nutrients from those areas and pass them along to the subdural space. And then we have the blue pia mater. And notice how the pia mater dips into the sulci of the skull. So it's very much kind of like a saran wrap for the, for the brain. And the saran wrap for the brain is going to dip into its gyri, or over its gyri, into its sulci, and it's really going to protect and cover the very fragile neuronal tissue. So the dura mater is the outermost meningeal layer. It's leathery, it's strong, it's thick, it's composed of two fibrous connective tissue layers, and the layers separate in certain areas to form those dural sinuses, also filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So here's some examples of those dural sinuses that dip into large fissures. There is a tentorium cerebelli, which is in the transverse fissure, and the fox cerebi, which is going to dip into the longitudinal fissure. Here's a better view of the dural sinuses, again, just enlargements or folds of the dura mater that create these partitions in the skull. Next, we'll talk more about the arachnoid mater, again, the middle meningeal layer. It's a loose brain covering. It also covers the spinal cord. It's separated from the dura mater via its subdural space. Subdural meaning under the dura mater. So that space between the arachnoid mater and the dura mater is the subdural space. And that subdural space is going to be filled with cerebrospinal fluid. And we find that beneath the arachnoid is a wide subarachnoid space. It's the subarachnoid space between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater that's filled with even more cerebrospinal fluid and really large blood vessels. We also saw in the first image that is repeated below, that the arachnoid villi protrude superiorly into things like the dural sinuses and permit cerebrospinal fluid to be absorbed from venous blood. And last but not least is the pia mater. 
The pia mater is the innermost or deepest meningeal layer that covers the brain itself. It's very delicate, it's thin, but it's connective tissue. It clings tightly to the brain, it goes into or over the gyri and into the sulci, and it's also found around the spinal cord. So keep in mind that even though we're focusing on the brain, that the three meningeal layers also cover, in the same order, the spinal cord. Cerebrospinal fluid is a watery solution similar in composition to blood plasma, and it contains less protein, has some different ion concentrations than plasma, but it is still similar in concentration. It does give some buoyancy or floating abilities to the brain. We also find cerebrospinal fluid inside the ventricles, and so it's able to kind of carry signals either nutrient or chemical, throughout the brain and nourish it. It also prevents the brain from crushing under its own weight, so it floats within the skull, and it protects the central nervous system from blows and other trauma. Next, we want to talk about the blood-brain barrier. Now, the blood-brain barrier is really a barrier. It's protective. It helps maintain a stable environment for the brain. It's to separate the central nervous system from the rest of the body because certain amino acids and hormones and even ions that exist in the body and may act one way would act differently in the brain. In the brain, they may act as a neurotransmitter and cause neurons to fire or cause an increase in synaptic activity. So we really need to regulate and control what gets past the blood-brain barrier and into the brain so that we can have regulated, controlled synaptic activity. There are three parts to the blood-brain barrier. There's the continuous endothelium of capillary walls found around the brain, the relatively thick basal lamina between the continuous endothelium of capillary walls, and the bulbous feet of astrocytes. So astrocytes are the glial cell that help make up part of the blood-brain barrier. And the next thing we want to talk about is just acknowledge some traumatic head injuries. There's concussion, contusion, subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage, and cerebral edema. A concussion is going to be the least severe here. It's a slight trauma, kind of bump your head a little too hard. No permanent neurological damage would be caused. Whereas a contusion actually causes bruising of the brain. So it would be a harder bump to the head. It would be when the brain actually kind of hits the skull. It can cause a coma if the contusion occurs on the brain stem. A subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage can cause someone to deteriorate neurologically because hemorrhaging is referencing bleeding and bleeding either in the subdural or subarachnoid space. And if that pushes on the brainstem, it can not only cause someone to deteriorate neurologically, but it can also cause death because the brainstem is really important. It controls things like heart rate and rhythm, so it lets the heart beat. It also controls respiratory rate and depth. So breathing and your heart beating are very important, and if they cease because of pressure on the brainstem, that can lead to death. The same thing can be said for cerebral edema, and while it's not blood causing swelling in the brain or pushing on the brainstem, that swelling of the brain can cause death. The pressure pushes on those medulla, medulla oblongata areas that are important for the heart and breathing. Another homeostatic imbalance is cerebrovascular accidents, which you probably know better as strokes. Strokes occur when there's blood circulation that is blocked to the brain and brain tissue as a result dies because it's not able to get nutrients and it's not able to get oxygen. The brain tissue is very intolerant of ischemia. It needs oxygen. It needs the oxygen to make energy. And usually the most common cause of a stroke is a blockage of a cerebral artery. But other causes do exist if you compress compress different parts of the brainstem via either hemorrhage or edema or atherosclerosis in a cerebral artery, all of those could cause a stroke as well or a cerebrovascular accident. Transient ischemic attacks are temporary episodes of reversible cerebral ischemia. So this is maybe when you have like a partial clot and for a moment in time there is going to be reduced blood flow to an area. A common treatment really was recommended as a treatment for cerebrovascular accidents is tissue plasminogen activator, which is going to treat the clot and help remove it in order to treat or reverse or prevent any further symptoms from the stroke. We're also next going to look at some degenerative brain disorders. There's Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson's disease, and Huntington's disease. Alzheimer's disease results in dementia, and this is going to be caused by the degenerative, progressive degenerative disease that really attacks different parts of the brain, also parts of the basal nuclei. There's Parkinson's disease, which is also caused by the degeneration of basal nuclei, like a substantia nigra, which are dopamine-releasing neurons. And then Huntington's disease is a fatal hereditary disorder caused by the accumulation of protein Huntington, and that buildup of the protein Huntington actually is going to cause or degenerate some other basal nuclei. So the basal nuclei are really important for a lot of motor activity and alertness. 
We also want to mention cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy can be caused before birth, at birth, or shortly thereafter. And it's a lack of oxygen to the developing fetus or newborn. And it's when that lack of oxygen causes voluntary muscles to be poorly controlled or poorly, poorly developed. And this can be mild to severe. The severe version is complete paralyzation. Multiple sclerosis was a condition talked about at the end of chapter 11. So just a reminder that this is a degenerative brain disorder. It's a demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system, wherein oligodendrocytes that myelinate the axons of central nervous system neurons are destroyed. But let's not forget the spinal cord. So the brain is one structure of the central nervous system. The spinal cord is the other. And the spinal cord is fragile. It's fragile fragile central nervous system tissue, but it's enclosed within the vertebral column for its protection. But it's also protected by the meninges, so we have the dura, arachnoid, and pia mater also around the spinal cord, and it's going to have cerebrospinal fluid not only in its central canal, which is continuous with the fourth ventricle of the brain, but also around it in the meninges. There's also an epidural space between the vertebra and the dural sheath or dura mater, and that dural space, the epidural space, is filled with fat. Also some networks of veins. The location of the spinal cord is between the foramen magnum and the first or second lumbar vertebrae. The spinal cord functions as a two-way communication system to and from the brain. It also has some spinal reflex centers. There are a couple of structures in the spinal cord that we want to acknowledge such as the dorsal horns, ventral horns, lateral horns, dorsal roots, and dorsal root or spinal ganglia. Now, if we talk about how information gets to the spinal cord, then goes up to the brain via the spinal cord, then back down the spinal cord from the brain, we have to mention the dorsal and ventral horns. So the dorsal horns are going to be parts of spinal nerves that are adjacent or abut the back of the spinal cord. They also include some interneurons, but mainly sensory neurons that receive somatic and visceral sensory input. The ventral horns are going to be near the ventral nerve roots, which are going to abut the anterior or front side of the spinal cord. The ventral horns themselves are gray matter that may contain some interneurons that, or some somatic motor neurons that receive motor outputs and have it exit the spinal cord. So what we're seeing here is that the gray matter dorsal horns and the gray matter ventral horns of the spinal cord receive and send out information a certain way. So sensory information is received via the back of the spinal cord, goes up to the brain, integration happens, comes down to the brain, and then that motor output is going to leave the spinal cord via the front or the ventral roots via the ventral horns. A lot of that motor information, if it's somatic, is going to go to skeletal muscles. There's also lateral horns involved in the fight or flight system, so with that autonomic nervous system. Dorsal roots are near the dorsal horns, but they abut the back part of the spinal cord. Ventral roots abut the front part of the spinal cord. And the dorsal root ganglia is an area where there are cell bodies of sensory neurons. So a lot of this is easier to understand with this image. So the branching here in the back that is the dorsal root, the branching here in the front, that is the ventral root, the dorsal root abuts the spinal cord in the back and is close to the back or ventral gray matter, sorry, the back or dorsal gray matter. The ventral root is close to the front or ventral gray matter. So here is the dorsal horn, it's gray matter. Here is the ventral horn, it's gray matter. The ventral horn is gray matter near the front of the spinal cord, and the ventral root attaches to the front of the spinal cord. The dorsal horn is near the back of the spinal cord, and the dorsal root is going to attach to the back of the spinal cord. We can also see a central canal, which is in between the gray matter or near the commissural fibers. The gray commissure is the connection between the two sides of gray matter. The central canal is going to be continuous with the fourth ventricle of the brain, and it would contain cerebrospinal fluid. We can also see the pia mater, 
the arachnoid mater and the dura mater that would wrap around the spinal cord and parts of these mixed spinal nerves. There are about 31 spinal nerves that emanate from the spinal cord and we're calling them mixed spinal nerves because both the sensory and the motor nerves come together in order to exit away from the spinal cord. More about the spinal cord, we want to acknowledge, for example, the white matter columns. The white matter columns contain mainly nerve information that's carried along an axon, so that's why it's white matter, because it's myelinated axons. So myelinated and non-myelinated nerve fibers can actually be found in this region between parts of the spinal cord and the spinal cord and the brain. And these outer white matter columns have nerve pathways that go in a couple of different directions. There is the ascending, descending, and transverse nerve pathways. So ascending neural pathways are pathways that run up to the brain or to the higher centers of the brain. So a lot of sensory inputs are going to run up the spinal cord to the brain. Descending pathways run down the spinal cord. They may run down just from a higher to a lower point in the spinal cord or from the brain to the spinal cord. And a lot of the descending signals are motor outputs that are leaving the brain and going to their effector organ. Transverse or commissural signals travel from one white column area to another or travel across the spinal column. So that's why you see fibers that are connecting across each side of the spinal column is called a commissure. The gray commissure is located within the gray matter. But there is also commissural fibers that would decussate or move from one side to another along the spinal column as information runs up or down. Next, we're going to talk about the spinal nerves. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that are attached by paired, so ventral or dorsal roots, to the spinal cord. The spinal nerves emerge from the spinal cord between the, verte between the vertebrae, and again, 31 pairs, and each nerve is going to emerge in two short branches, so roots. On the front, the motor or anterior root of the spinal cord, or on the back, the sensory or posterior root of the spinal cord. Those are our two options for where each nerve emerges. The motor roots are going to carry commands from the brain and spinal cord to other parts of the body, particularly to skeletal muscles. And then the sensory roots, they'll carry information to the brain from other parts of the body. There's other structures we want to acknowledge, like the cauda equina. The cauda equina is where the spinal cord ends, about three-fourths of the way down the spine. But this is a bundle of nerves that extends beyond the cord. The cauda equina kind of looks like a horse's tail. And this bundle carries nerve impulses to and from the legs. Another structure, let's go back for just one second. Another structure we just want to acknowledge is the phylum terminal. The phylum terminal is an extension of the pia mater that is attached to the coccygeal segments of the coccyx. And this, or its function, is to really just suspend the spinal cord in some excess cerebrospinal fluid, because again, it's ending before the cauda equina at the conus medullaris. Here we're looking at a vertebrae, a vertebrae surrounding the spinal cord. We can see how the mixed roots containing sensory and motor information are here able to leave and go out to different parts of the body. We can see the internal gray matter, the outer white matter of the spinal cord, and we can see the fat in the epidural space between the spinal cord, especially the dura mater of the spinal cord, and the vertebrae or bone itself. We're also seeing the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater, or the spinal meninges. One of our last topics is more on neuronal pathways. And all major spinal tracts are going to be a part of multi-neuron pathways. Again, they can be ascending or descending or commissural. These ascending and descending pathways contain not only spinal cord neurons, but also parts of peripheral neurons and neurons in the brain. So, for example, general characteristics of neuron pathways involves decussation or the ability of this neuron signal to cross from one side of the spinal cord to the other, Relay, so a series of neurons involved in getting signals up or down the spinal cord. This precise spatial relationship of where we're sending signals in the spinal cord, depending on where the effector is or where it's going in the brain. And symmetry, so we see that these pathways, these neuronal pathways, are paired in the white matter columns of the spinal cord.
ascending or sensory pathways, they're generally going to conduct sensory impulses upwards. So ascending pathways are sensory, and these sensory ascending pathways conduct signals upward towards higher brain centers. Ascending pathways are going to involve three successive neurons to create a neuronal pathway. These three neurons are called the first, second, and third order neurons. There are two ascending pathways we want to talk briefly about that deal with conscious and subconscious thought, specifically related to proprioception and discriminative touch. Those are the spinocerebellar and dorsal column medial lumeniscal pathways, respectively. There's also a third pathway, ascending pathway, that is related to the transmission of pain and temperature information, and that would be the lateral spinal thalamic pathway. With the descending tracks, we don't have three neurons. So again, three neurons in ascending pathways, first, second, third order. In descending or motor pathways, where signals are going to travel away from the brain or to lower parts of the spinal cord, there are only two neurons. Those neurons are called the upper and lower neuron. So an example of a motor pathway that would use an upper and lower neuron would be the use in commanding your bicep brachii to contract of a neuron that's mainly in your peripheral nervous system called the somatic motor neuron and an interneuron from your brain. Here we can see the symmetry that the ascending and descending tracks have on each side of the spinal cord. So words like lateral reticular spinal tract, ventral white commissural fissure, lateral spinal thalamic tract, just be familiar with them being a part of the white columns or a part of the gray matter of the spinal cord. Another thing we're going to look at is homeostatic imbalances. We have spinal cord trauma and disorders. Paralysis and paresthesias are examples. So paralysis involves the loss of motor function, so usually some type of damage to the ventral roots of the spinal cord or attached to the spinal cord. Paresthesias involves loss of sensory function, usually something wrong with the dorsal roots attached to the spinal cord. Paraplegia is when only the lower limbs are affected. Quadriplegia is when all four limbs are affected. And hemiplegia is when one side of the body is affected, which is normally a result of damage to the brain. Another disorder we want to look at is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, more commonly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And this is caused by the progressive destruction of anterior and ventral horn neurons and pyramidal tracts. So it does cause damage to both the ventral horn or the front roots going to the spinal cord and therefore motor signals going to muscles. And that is it for part B of chapter 12. Make sure to review both part A and part B and read your lecture textbook.